Well, good morning. Welcome to Cool Spring. My name is Greg English, and we're excited to gather together today as a body of believers and share in the mission of Cool Spring, and that's reach and develop all people into fully committed followers of Christ. As we do that, we're fortunate to have multiple ministries and opportunities to partner together. And today we have uh, the East End Pregnancy Center uh, with us today. As you know, over the last month, we've been collecting the baby bottles. Uh, throughout the last couple of weeks, turning those in and providing, helping support uh, their mission. And today, Ann Campbell is the director of the Pregnancy Center, and she's here today, today to share a little bit of that message. Ann, welcome to Cool Spring. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here. Um, thank you also for partnering with us the last four years. Uh, the Pregnancy Help Movement is quite challenging realm in which to work, and there are many stages of maturing that takes place. Uh, so thank you for sticking with us. Larry Ag was certainly a driving force, and he was an extremely um, compassionate man, and he is missed. And I'd also like to thank Bill Anderson. He uh, was our treasurer for the past three years, and there are many in the congregation who have uh, been volunteering at the center, so we thank you. The fear and uncertainty surrounding an unplanned pregnancy and the topic of abortion is a sensitive one, and every demographic has been affected by it, and I would go so far as to say every family. Not only have we heard story after story at our center, but I've heard many stories firsthand from people within the church who carry deep pain. And if you have not done so, I sincerely encourage you to reach out to your pastoral team and contact me, or contact me, and I can connect you with someone for confidential support. There is healing, and God will use your journey to minister to others. Eastern Pregnancy Center's mission is to offer hope to the Richmond community as a life-affirming, gospel-centered ministry. Our door is open to serving men and women with pregnancy decisions through medical, educational, material and spiritual care. Just a little short background, East End Pregnancy Center began in 2012 as a resource center offering the main things, diapers, formula, beds, uh, car seats, that kind of thing, and of course gospel guidance. But in 2018, it became very clear that we were not reaching uh, many at-risk mothers and babies uh, because we needed medical services. So. Uh, through the assistance of NIFLA, which is the National Institute, National Institute of Family Life Advocates, they walked with us through a year-long process to become medical. And uh, so, January 1, 19, which is also my first day as being a director, we began ultrasound services led through our registered nurse team. And many of you know that the ultrasound is the only way that a, a pregnancy can be confirmed. What's even more miraculous is you can see the baby's heartbeat at five weeks and five days. So this is, lives have been saved. They, they certainly have. But as you know, there are many cultural and personal factors that don't guarantee this outcome. Our society has become increasingly desensitized to the value of human life. In the summer of 2021, we added a physician assistant to our staff. We were kind of blindsided by this opportunity, but it was definitely an opportunity because we are one of the few centers in the United States that has one, and there are about 3,000 other centers around the country. So we feel incredibly blessed because that means that we can up our medical services and be able to serve these women even more in depth. With that dimension of our ministry, it does elevate our budget to a different level, and that's why the baby bottle campaign is so vital. Literally every penny will go towards our medical and our center operations, and so these are vital campaigns, so thank you so much for participating in that. It is a little difficult to sum up everything we do in several minutes, but I just wanted to kind of go over some of the challenges that we have uh, moving ahead. And it's, it's really a miracle that we are now living in a post row world. But unfortunately, that doesn't mean that it's over. Abortion is not over. It's not outlawed in our state. 
Um, in our beloved Virginia, there are many politicians who want to enshrine abortion at any stage of pregnancy into our state law. Every single November is vital. Uh, another challenge that we face is, is reaching women via their phones. Um, now, you know, everything's quick, quick decisions, quick, very quick decisions. And it, it's dawning because our center faces big tech censorship and false narratives concerning our ministry. Our ministries across the United States, the pregnancy health movement as a, as a whole. Chemical medicine is easily obtained online and they're not requiring a physical examination or an ultrasound. Um, and as I've said earlier in, in the earlier services, the majority of abortions are not taking place at the clinics. They are happening in homes. Of course, COVID-19 did not help with that. That's really when it got more ramped up during the COVID years. And additionally, pills are shipped from international locations with no guidelines and precautions in place. This is dangerous and, quite frankly, unconscionable. It's certainly not health care. We have a long way to go in changing hearts and minds regarding the preciousness and value of every human being, but we remain undeterred in our mission, and we will keep going with you by our side. I love the song that we sang this morning, The Battle Belongs to Him, and that is so true, and it's refreshing and freeing to think about that. We just need to be obedient to what he's called us to do. And, and God is going to, to provide for us, which he does. Also, if you're in a season of life and you haven't discerned how God may want you to engage in this realm, there are many opportunities to get involved. Bill was fortunate to replace himself. That was a tall order. But um, perhaps you want to continue to uh, financially partner with us or even become an advocate and work with these beautiful women and men and families that we come into contact with on a daily basis. I know that Cool Spring is filled with families that are foster parents and that have, have um, expanded their families through the adoption process. And I appreciate, Brad, the, the seriousness in which Cool Spring takes the gospel and is dedicated to respecting the sanctity of life. We love the phrase, the pro-life movement is truly from the womb to the tomb, and you guys have exemplified that, so thank you. The vision of Eastern Pregnancy Center is a city where abortion is unthinkable because people know God as their redeemer and creator, the creator and redeemer of life. Many of you saw our calendars last year. I think Larry was out giving those out. And if you guys could go to the next slide, it'd be, it'd be great. This was one of our little guys featured. Um, and that is a true statement. Because of you, his mom chose life. That, that's one of our patient's children. She was definitely not coming to see us originally. But um, life is sacred. I love looking at his little face. And thankfully, there are many more faces that we, that we know about and some that we don't know about. So life is sacred. The work to save lives is sacred work, and we cannot do it without the church. We cannot exist without your investment of time and prayer. And thank you so much, School Spring. And I look forward to seeing you at our new center. We just moved on to, uh, down to South Laburnum, so we'd love to see you at an open house. Thank you. Thank you, Ann, for, for your work and dedication. And uh, this time I'd like to introduce Missy Hurtless. Some of you may know Missy. She's a member of Cool Spring. And uh, she is our new liaison uh, for Cool Spring to the East End Pregnancy Center. So, Missy. I just wanted to tell you guys I'm honored um, to serve in this role. Um, I, I thank Ann and East End Pregnancy for what they do. Um, I thank Larry for starting this ministry. And I pray that I continue it on as he would like it to be seen. And Brad, I want to thank you for your sermon. I've been in two now this morning. And I, I thank you. I know that you were talking to me and about me. So I thank you. Um, thank, thank you all for, your, for the baby bottle campaign and for contributing. We appreciate it. Thank you.
So as we continue to worship, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you now just uh, in a pause. To still our hearts and to still our minds and our spirit to center back to you. Father, as we do that, we thank you for life. We thank you for the gift of life that you've given us through your son, Jesus, that gives us freedom and redemption and salvation and grace. A love that's given so generously that oftentimes it's hard to even comprehend. But we come before you, we hallow your name, and we say thank you. And Father, we do pray for Anne. We pray for the team and the staff at East End Pregnancy Center. Father, as they, as they hear stories, difficult stories and challenges that come before them, May your presence, may your demeanor, may your wisdom, your insight, your love, God, would it exude there so those who are seeking, Father, would see and experience your presence and recognize that you can do more than we can ever imagine according to your word. Father, we thank you for this gift of life. May we use it and serve you well. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together now.
Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Hey, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I have nothing else fit for a king. Except for a heart singing hallelujah, John, Kathy, thank you <clears throat> for sharing this morning. Beautiful, beautiful song, beautiful song. Paul, as always, it's good to see you too. Thank you. We're talking, it's been a while, it's been a while, so glad that you're here. He knows how to play an organ too, so uh, he does a good job. Jill, you do too. We appreciate, <clears throat> appreciate you too. Um, I do like it when it shakes the building, don't you? At least as long as nothing falls. I like it when it shakes, <clears throat> shakes the building. That's, that's a good thing. So I want you, before we kind of jump in, I, I want you to think about something with me. I want for you to spend some time, uh, I want you to think about the character of God. The character of God. What is he to you? I want you to think not just about the character of God, but I want you to think about the attributes of God. What are the unique attributes that speak in Scripture, speak in scripture about God? <clears throat> Define who He is and how He operates. But I also want you to think about how you have seen God work. What are the ways in which you have watched Him work recently over the years but the observation of his moving what have you seen and then i want you to think about his promises everyone in here has had or has stuff in life and with that stuff, oftentimes as we delve into Scripture, God gives us promises. That's something you hold on to. You don't let go. You hold on to it. And maybe it's for a few days, a few weeks, a few months, a few years. Maybe you're still holding on to that promise and it's not yet come to pass or it has not taken place yet. <laughs> But I want you to think about his character, his attributes, where you've seen him work, promises that he's given you. And in just a moment, I'm, I'm going to invite you to participate. This is the only time you get to yell back at me, at least right in a service, right? But I'm going to have you yell these out. I want you to call them out. 
Because I want you to know something. <laughs> As I look at you, you are a strange bunch. <laughs> In fact, Scripture calls us peculiar. That's right. <laughs> Thank goodness, right? But we are a peculiar people. In fact, if you were to read over in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, and you were in the King James Version, it would call you peculiar. You're odd. You're different. You stand out. I was reading this passage again recently, and it just struck me. But you... Our chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own <coughs> possession. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into the marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. As Ann says, Jesus loves us. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You are a peculiar people, a chosen people, a royal people, a holy people, a people of his possession that you would proclaim the excellencies of him who called you, who summoned you out of darkness and into light. And so in these brief moments, I want for you to call out words that define his character, words that speak of his attributes, words that speak of his working, words that describe his promises. Because I want you to speak of his excellencies. You know what's interesting? We do a lot of stuff in community. We do a lot of different things. In the Mechanicsville, Richmond area. But so does the United Way. Do you know the only difference between the United Way? Well, there's several, but one I'm going to draw attention to in Cool Spring mm -hmm. is that we are people of the resurrection. We have Jesus. That's our message. We speak of the excellencies of him who brought you out of darkness and into light. So on the count of three, in fact, I'm going to ask you to stand up. You can't do it sitting down. I'm going to ask you, on the count of three, to call out His Excellencies. One, two, three. Grace. So, we might say that's not the end of Sovereign. Grace. 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 Come on. <laughs> Gotta have more. Direction. Truth. Surprising. Truth. Peace. Truth. Peace. Truth. Peace. Truth. Peace. Truth. Peace. Beautiful. Would you pray with me, Father? We stand before you calling out your excellencies. We love you. <clears throat> Thank you for loving us. Lord, today we, we dig into your word to know you better and to know your call upon our life better. <laughs> this calling, this summoning that you brought us out of darkness into light, what does it look like for us to live in the light today? 
And so, Father, I pray in this room that your Holy Spirit would be working and moving and teaching, instructing. But, Father, today, we recognize you. You are the reason that we gather today. We love you. For it's in the powerful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You can remain standing for the next two hours. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> be seated, be seated. I want to say, I think you all did better than the first two hours. <clears throat> um, I was surprised. 8.30 was, like 8.45 was, um, was pretty awake, which was good. Just wait till March 12th. <clears throat> I ain't going to be so awake uh, as the clock moves forward, but... <clears throat> We're finishing up our our series on Jesus Speaks today. We've looked at five different occasions where Jesus has responded to a question or made a statement that impacts the formation, the growth, the maturing of our faith. Today we look at a short passage, but a, a moment that gives us a glimpse into the deep relationship that we have with the Father, this meaningful, intimate relationship that we have with Him, and how it impacts everything that we do. It's a passage <clears throat> that speaks about our dependence on Him and what that looks like. And so if you, if you have your Bibles... It's over in Mark chapter 12, beginning in verse 41. It says, as he sat down opposite the treasury and, and watched the people putting money into the offering box, many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he, Jesus, called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. Jesus explains his statement. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything else she had, all she had, to live on. It's kind of an interesting moment. As people are coming and dropping off their offering, it's the biggest offerings are the loudest offerings. The loudest offerings grant the, the biggest attention. And yet here's this widow with two small coins that doesn't even amount to a clink. She almost goes by unnoticed. But Jesus, knowing the heart, knowing this woman's situation, speaks to us about a spiritual principle that's important about our formation. The word poverty here is a word that's used twice in the New Testament. It is translated need. So what we find is that this woman gave out of her need. She lived out of her need, this, this lacking. The other time this word is used when Paul says in Philippians uh, 4 that he knows what it is to be in need. He knows what it is to be in plenty. And he knows what it is to be content in both. So what we find here is this conversation about the difference between living out of the abundance or living out of the need. Giving out of the abundance or giving out of the need. That's interesting. 
We have a typical fashion in North America that we do things out of abundance. Not just money, it can be money, but it could be time, it could be interest, it could be things that we have space to do, and so the idea is that out of the abundance we do things, this is the difference. When you do things out of the abundance, you don't need God. Or put it this way, you don't recognize it. But when you do things out of need, you recognize your dependence on Him. And I want you to know, it's better to live in dependence than it is to live in abundance. And so what I want to talk to you about today is about how do we live in dependence? How do we live in the need? How do we live out the need? Rather than the abundance. It's interesting when you think about the need, when I look across this room, I, I do see people that have been broken. People have had dreams dashed, loss and grief. You've been hurt, there's pain. Things that you don't talk about, things that you've stuck way back in the back recesses of your life. There's disadvantage. Do you realize that that is your place of need? That is your place that you need to depend upon the Lord. I firmly believe that God is calling people in this room right now to live from their need. To live out their need. It is this idea that you are living in dependence of him. You are dealing with, working with, doing things, stepping out from places that, that you could not do it unless it was him. You need him. I firmly believe that this widow epitomizes for me Matthew 11, which is this picture of taking on the yoke of Christ, and yet wearing that yoke, she knows that it is not heavy, and yet in it she finds rest and direction in life. So oftentimes we look at the yoke as being confining, but yet the yoke is truly unleashing. See, it is a picture of dependence, of a dependence upon Jesus. And when you live in dependence of him, you find rest. The world can be a whirlwind. Life can be crazy. <clears throat> but when you depend upon him and live in that dependence, you will experience rest. But what keeps us, <clears throat> what keeps us from living in the need and choosing to live in the abundance? What is it that causes us to, to say no to the need or to run away from the need and living out of the need, living in dependence of him? What is it that keeps us from doing that? Number one, there's worry. Number two, there's a struggle with contentment. And number three, there is this battle with idols. But think about worry for just a minute. And how we get in our situations in life that we don't like to put ourselves in a space where we are dependent on someone else, let alone dependent upon God, if we think we can maneuver it and make it happen ourselves. 
But what happens is we begin chasing things that create worry for us. For example, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 31, Jesus says, Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? He says, For the Gentiles, that's a code word for not so good things, pagans, they seek after all these things. So he's noting that there is a group of people that, that seek after, that look after, that desire, that search after that what they're going to eat and what they're drinking and what they're going to wear. They're going to worry about finding these and having these and securing these. He says, the Gentiles seek after all these things and your heavenly father knows you need them all. He knows that you need them. But then he makes this dramatic shift. Instead of seeking these things, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, and what you're going to wear, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. You see, when you live in the abundance, you don't necessarily need to acquire or at least for that season. But when you choose to live in dependence out of your need, you spend time in the inquiry, seeking. I remember when they used to blow the horn. <laughs> that wasn't in the notes, but that's just what we heard, right? Give you an illustration of that. Um, by the way, that was Julia. That's the youngest of the five. Um, she's eight months old, and we figured there'd be great sound effects for East End Pregnancy Center while they were up here um, that she was doing. Uh, she's a sweetheart, um, and she's one of the three that's with, with us. Um, and it's interesting. We've, we've, been, we've got multiple kids, and so we're having to cart multiple kids around. Um, and, and many of you know I drive a Mini Cooper, uh, 2016, got 102,000 miles on it. Have a new sunroof, thank you for $1,200, but um, um, I still love the car and like to drive it, but I will tell you this, there is no space for kid seats in my car. Um, that runs into a little bit of a challenge. Uh, my wife walks, walks, rides around with two car seats. My, my daughter has three um, in her, her car. And I always like the excuse, oh, gee, I don't have any room for the kids. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't go, I, that went over all right for a few weeks. It doesn't, months into this deal, it doesn't work. And so we've kind of toured around, what about if we just uh, if I trade in the Mini, and get something, you know, get a 2016, 17, um, look at a couple of different Kias or something like that and find something, four seats or four seats, uh, two seats or, you know, something like that, uh, sedan or a small white SUV. And, so we looked at different things and uh, got a couple of buddies that have some great little SUVs. And so um, it was funny. I'm thinking out of the abundance because what I'm doing is I can go before I can do that. That's not a big deal. Um, and the same thing is I can justify it. How many of you all justify your arguments or justify your position or justify your purchases and never pray about it? Don't do that. It gets you in trouble. And it was really funny, one night I was looking at some stuff online, like cars, and, and it struck me. Have you prayed about your need? And so I'm like, no, I really haven't. Well, I guess I should. So I start praying for several days. And almost as clear as day, my home was scanning and looking at some stuff and just like I heard this message and somebody said wait just wait and right now we can make it happen we trade off cars and all that kind of stuff somebody takes the big car takes the kids to school come back we trade it off at the house who's going to be there by you know we, we do all that great thing for texting and phones right you know get to the right place but it was just 
It was just this message of wait. So guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to wait. But what's funny, I've thought about this so much about the abundance and the need, doing stuff out of abundance and living out of the need. And so I choose to live out of the need. I need to do that more. That's a great example. I'm not worried about it. I can make the vehicles, they work. Just wait. So when I think about worries and anxiety keeping us from living dependent, because we're trying to find our own solutions and craft our own path, but there's another one about contentment. And that's our, our battle, our seeking to, to find and experience and, and to be content. But there's, there's a lesson in contentment. Hebrews 13 verse 5 says, Keep your life free, or your way of life free, from, from the love, from the desire, the greediness of money. And be content with what you have. And it's like an underlying piece. It's interesting the word content is used eight times in the New Testament. Specifically, it relates to being content with your wages, your clothing, and your possessions, except for one occasion. And you'll love this. You can write this one down. This is good. The other time that it's used is when God speaks to Paul and says, My grace is sufficient. 2 Corinthians Chapter 12, verse 9. My grace is sufficient. The word sufficient is contentment. May you say that with me. As if God says, my grace is contentment. God's self-giving of himself, that's grace. It's in him that we know contentment. It's not in stuff. It's not in money. It's not in possessions. It's not in anything. It is in him that there is contentment. Man, there's still people all over the world trying to chase stuff and find contentment, and they will never find it. It will always be elusive. Now, there's nothing wrong with stuff. But when it is what you seek for the sake of being content, you will never, 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 let me say it again, never, 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 never find it. The only way you find contentment is in him. He's my contentment. And so when we think about the pursuit of contentment keeping us from, from living out in the need, living out the need, the place of dependence, Idols. What are idols? Idols are those things that are either in front, alongside, or behind God that, that vie for our attention and our affection that we place that much importance on. It takes the place of God in so many ways in our life. I think it's interesting that 1 John, the end of the letter, says this, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. That's the last word. That's the important thought as he finishes the letter. Keep yourselves from idols. And perhaps maybe the, the biggest picture of, 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 of struggle with an idol for me is found over Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 17. And it's Jesus' conversation with the, with the rich young man. Down in verse 17, he says, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit life? Jesus says to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and, and mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these I have kept for my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, <laughs> loved him. You know, I think that's such a powerful statement right there. In all of our spiritual struggles and desire for definition and purpose and 
hope and life. He loves us. That man was struggling with where to find life. He had everything but life. And Jesus, knowing that he was struggling with the question, loved him. And he said to him, you lack one thing. This has always been kind of a, a difficult pill to swallow for some people. Because they're like, well, do I need to do the same thing? Listen. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Semicolon. New thought. And come and follow me. What Jesus is speaking about is idolatry. His possessions, it says, disheartened, he grieved by what was said, and he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions, he had great property. He loved his stuff. And the idea of letting go of his stuff was more than he could do. It was his God, in a way. Jesus is calling us to take a strong look at our idols. We all have them. Sometimes there's seasons certain idols seem to move into the family room. We dust them off and we welcome them. All the while we need to put them in the trash out by the street on Friday when waste management comes by. Sometimes we just dust them off and put them back in the back closet, thinking that's far enough away. But the thought is, what is it that interferes with you living in a dependent relationship with Jesus? What are the things that are getting in the way? The idols that are in the idols can be things, it can be people, it can be money, it can be stuff. Be all kinds of things. Ideas? Dreams? What is it that stands as a block keeping you from? This is an interesting, interesting thought. When we think about this widow who came that day and, and put her two coins in the offering box. She gave what she had because she knows the one who will provide. She had seen him provide over and over and over again. She was just faithful to the faithful one. It's about living in a dependent relationship with the Father. Not about out of abundance what you think you can do for him or do for yourself. But living dependent on him in what he has for you, his mission, his purpose, his direction, his life for you. There is a sweetness in the dependence. It is there that you know rest. It's there that you know peace. It's there that you know joy. It's there that you experience and know him. The call today is to live dependently on him from the place of me. It's interesting um, what Missy said when she was finishing and leaving. Um, I really don't have people in mind when I... <laughs> 
he gives it's a give talks and so forth. That's not my 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 mo in that. But I've, it's interesting that there are people in this room that God wants you to live out of that need and dependence of Him, out of that brokenness, out of that hurt, out of that injury, out of that past. Because of the experience you have walking that journey, he wants to use that experience for his glory. But he won't until he, you allow him and surrender to him to work it. There's new ministry in this room. When people say yes to dependence upon him. Amen. The question is, who will it be? Would you pray with me? Father, I am grateful for your word and the truth it contains. I am grateful for the opportunity. Lord, as the people gathered, the shout of your excellencies. Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. We honor you. We adore you today. Father, I pray for my friends and family in the room that... Uh, Lord, may today be a day where they draw close to you and see you at work in their lives. And that, Father, you would be glorified today in them for your glory, for their good. Father, I recognize that you are at work in this place. You're at work on these 20 plus acres, but you're at work in our community. We're seeing people come to faith. We're seeing people take that next step. We're seeing people live in a dependent relationship with you, surrendered, repenting. Father, you'll be glorified. And Holy Spirit, would you continue to work in this place and work on us and in us and through us. We love you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing a song. Great is thy faithfulness, right? Yes, uh, a, um, an old Baptist standard. Um, and, uh, but I want you to sing the words. I want to sing a couple of stanzas. But I wanted to sing this song because I wanted you to be reminded that you can depend on him. Wherever that place of need is for him to work out of in your life, you can depend on him because he is faithful. And so as we sing today... I want you to think about a couple of things. One is about what's your next step. Perhaps God's calling you to take that next step in membership here at Full Spring. You've been a guest for some time. You've never made that step to join. It's time. Maybe God's calling you to be baptized. We're baptizing. We're stirring these waters up on the 12th of, of March. Um, we invite you. Um, if, if, if you need to be baptized, you've not been baptized by immersion scripturally. After you believe, we want you to be baptized. You need to be Maybe God's calling you to faith. Maybe as you sit here and you listen and you think about the day the Holy Spirit's working on you, has been for the last several weeks. He's calling you to believe. To surrender, to repent, to place your faith in Christ and to follow Him. So that's your decision today. I'm going to invite you to come as we stand and sing last opportunity to prayer of you. If you're kind of Anxious about doing it in the group of people, man, let's talk after the service. It's about you doing business with God in these moments. So let's stand together and let's sing together. Pam, I'm as you lead us today.
lots of the way. The words just kept coming, and we're like, we're keeping on singing as long as the words are coming. <laughs> Please be seated for just a second. We'll pray out, but um, I want to, uh, Derek and Hannah. <laughs> No, 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 you're not. No, no. We're going to wait right to you almost, you know. So, uh, but um, many of you know Derek and, and Hannah. Derek serves as our student minister here at Cool Spring and has for a number of years. And um, we appreciate his uh, work and endeavor with our, our students here and have uh, done a great job. Um, I remember the day um, that you were interviewing and remember some of those early conversations. And part of the passion of Derek's heart was to one day be able to pastor a local church. Um, it's his passion, his heart. Um, that day has come. Um, he's been called by a church in the area to be senior pastor, and so uh, he will be leading out and preaching. And so we're excited that we've had the opportunity over these past years to pour into their lives as they have poured into ours. And so it's exciting to see God open up this new chapter and this new door and their faithfulness to his calling on their life. And so I want us just to pray over them, and this is our closing benediction, but it's a prayer of affirmation and blessing upon them. This will be their last Sunday here. They'll be here Wednesday night with the kids, but uh, this will be their last Sunday here. But you'll see them around and stuff like that. They're not far, far away, and they're still going to be living in the same house. So if you go by there and want to throw tomatoes, go ahead. No, it's a kid. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but they'll be close by, but um, just uh, appreciate them so much. Love them as a family, and um, I appreciate their contribution. Uh, to our families here, but let's have a word of prayer uh, today. Father, um, again, we speak of your excellencies, your, your grace and your sovereignty and, and your, your knowledge and your wisdom. And Lord, I thank you for the calling that you put on our lives and specifically the calling of the gospel ministry and calling to pastor a local church. And I thank you for um, <coughs> Derek's wrestling with that and uh, heeding that and following that and and I pray for Hannah, too, and Derek and their family as they transition uh, to this new place of leadership and shepherding. That, Father, you would protect them, that you'd guard them, that you would give them the words to say, that you'd give them the grace for each moment. And, Father, that you would speak life into them and to that congregation as well for your glory. And so, Lord, we're trusting you for the days ahead, and we're grateful for the partnership we've had over these years and this unique new partnership just as friends going forward and comrades in ministry. Lord, your blessing upon this sweet, sweet family as they follow you in obedience to your call. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you all. You all have a great day. And if you want to get up and go, you can. It's okay. <laughs>